I'm John Rigetti, Mary, the mother of God, the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos, who was Jesus' mother. Each Christian church views her quite differently. Father John Abdullah, Dean of St. George Orthodox Cathedral, will be talking with one of the foremost Orthodox theologians. He's Father Thomas Hopcoin as the Dean Emeritus of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary in Crestwood, New York. He's written countless articles, publications, and books, and is a sought-after speaker on Orthodox Christian faith issues. We're really fortunate that he's living here in the greater Pittsburgh area. Mary, the mother of God, this is how Orthodox Christians view her. Father Tom, welcome back to Orthodoxy Now. Thank you. Nice to be here. What is the Orthodox understanding of the place of Mary in the church? The place of Mary in the church. She's right in the middle. All right. <laughs> right in the head. Uh, Mary, of, uh, Christ's mother, Mary, uh, is, is extremely important, of course, in the Gospels and in, and in the life of the church. And I would say that in, uh, in one sentence, uh, for the Orthodox, Mary is the great example. Uh, she's the great example of what it means to be a mere human being. I say mere because Jesus is a real human being for us. He's really human like we are human. This is a dogma of our church. But Jesus is not merely human. He's God's Son who became human, born of Mary as virgin. Uh, and so for us, Mary is at the very center of the faith because we might even say that the whole of the preparation to the coming of Christ all the law, the Psalms, the prophets kind of existed, you might almost say, to produce this woman, this, this lowly, poor, totally faithful woman who, as she says in her song, her soul magnifies the Lord, her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior, uh, who is capable of becoming the mother of the Son of God. And Jesus' uh, father is God. You see, our, our teaching is that no human man is Jesus' father. Now, in the Scripture, Joseph is Jesus' father by Mosaic law because according to the law of Moses, the father is the one who takes the mother of a child into his house and names the baby. So in St. Matthew's okay. Gospel, sure. that's what Joseph is told by the angel to do. But we do not hold that Joseph is the biological father of Jesus. Mary conceives of the Holy Spirit and gives birth to the Christ, the Messiah. And in the scripture, when it speaks of, jo of Jesus' brothers and sisters, sure. yeah. uh, we, our tradition holds that they were not the biological children of Mary, uh, that they were, uh, the usual teaching is that they were Joseph's children by a previous marriage, because he was very old uh, when he took Mary uh, as his wife. Uh, but we believe that all of this is according to the scripture. The virgin will conceive and bear a child, uh, and that God will be come one of us, he will live with us, and that there will be this messianic king of whose kingdom there will be no end, and that's Mary's uh, child. Uh, so we think that she's exemplary because it's by her faith. You know, one of the things that, that uh, many Christians really hold very strongly, particularly Protestant Christians, is that we are saved by faith through grace. You know, we even like to say, not by works, lest any man should boast, sure. and so on. But Mary, if she's anything, she's faith. And if she's anything, she's grace. I mean, she's full of grace and totally believing. So she's the great example of the faithful person who is filled with grace upon whom the Holy Spirit dwells. So much so that she actually becomes the mother uh, of the Son of God. So that's, that's how we see her in, in the life of the church. So, and we believe that from her conception and her birth until her death, uh, that she's the great example. She's born of faith. Her parents, Joachim and Anna, according to the traditions, were very faithful people. Uh, they gave a third of their income to the poor, a third to the temple, a third they kept for themselves. They had no child. They prayed to God. This is all in a document called the Proto-Evangelium of James. It's a second century document. It's the, it's the first and virtually the only early Christian document that's totally about Mary. Because Mary in the scripture is a very hidden person. She gives birth to Christ. And basically, she appears in John's Gospel at the wedding in Cana, and then at the end, she stands by the cross. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when the, the brothers and, and his, the mother comes, and they say to Jesus, your mother and your brethren are here, he looks at the crowd and he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? 
And he says, the one who hears the word of God and does it is my mother, my brother, and my sister, you see. And Mary was the first to yes. do that. Yeah, in Luke's gospel, for example, in our church, as you well know, Father, every festival of the Virgin Mary, and we have all these church festivals of Mary, her conception, her birth, the Annunciation from the angel, then we have her, her death, chemesis, and, and for us it's important that she really dies. Uh, that's one of the differences that we have with the Latin church, because uh, at least until recent time it wasn't clear whether they taught that Mary really died. The assumption was more like her being taken bodily. Sure. But in our church, as you know, she actually, her death is patterned on the death of Jesus, because if she's the great example, she has to show that by faith in Christ and by the grace of God, she can transform death into a victory of life and be risen with Christ, her Savior. And Jesus is her Savior. If Jesus did not die on the cross and rise from the dead, Mary would be just as dead as the rest of us. <laughs> you you know, so, so very yeah. beautifully in the icon of the Feast of sure. Her Mission. Sure, yes, that's where right. We, where we see uh, Mary being lifted by her son. Yeah. Uh, and well, yeah, and in fact, it's too bad we don't have an uh, icon here today. We could have where uh, the incarnation icon, the icon of, of, of the Son of God becoming human, it shows Mary holding the baby Jesus in various positions. But in the icon of her death, she's shown lying on her deathbed. And then there's a, a thing in the icon called the mandorla. It means it's a yes. vision of spiritual reality. And it's just the reverse. It shows Jesus holding her, <laughs> taking her to heaven. So we believe, we believe that Mary is totally deified, that she's with God, that she lives to intercede for us with Christ, together with all the righteous dead. We have that faith. Sure. Because if you, if you have died with Christ in baptism, if you have been raised with Him, uh, then death can't, can't touch you. You pass into life. Would you say a little more about the preparation that, that uh, God did for us to prepare to prepare the world for, uh, for Mary to be able to say yes. Yeah, well, what we believe is this, is that God was totally faithful to, to His creation, to His human beings, however sinful they became. So if you read the Scriptures, the Law, the Psalms, the Prophets, what you're struck by is how faithful God is and how He's totally faithful and how He has to show His power, how He has to show that He's the one true God. That's why He has to pick his people, but he has to also find someone who's willing to cooperate with him. Sure. And, and those were Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the prophets, and ultimately Mary is the perfect example of cooperation with God, mainly believing in him, trusting him, rejoicing in him, uh, being obedient to him, loving him. Uh, but all of that obedience and love through the whole, what we call the Old Testament, it's all God's plan ultimately to show His most magnificent act. And His most magnificent act is to become incarnate as a human being and to die on the cross and to save the world. That's why some of our church fathers, they say, if you wanted to sum up the whole of Christian faith in two words, they would be womb and tomb. <laughs> Mary's womb, the Son of God becomes the Son of Man. Sure. And by the way, that's why we call her Theotokos. In the introduction, John used yes. the term Theotokos, and that was a big controversy because some uh, Christians in the 4th, 5th century, well, basically 5th century, uh, they didn't like the word Theotokos, which was already in use. It was already used in liturgy, which meant the one who bore God, the one who gave birth to God. So there were some Christians saying, hey, wait a minute. Mary didn't give birth to God. God can't be born. Uh, Mary gave birth to the man Jesus to whom the Son of God was joined, or to whom the Word of God was joined. But then our saints, like St. Cyril and others, they reacted and said, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. The Son of God is divine with the same divinity as God the Father. The Nicene Creed, which was a hundred so years earlier, it said that Jesus is God's only begotten Son, light from light, true God of true God, who was born on the earth of the Virgin Mary. So our, our faith is, the one that Mary gave birth to as a man is really the Son of God who is God together with God the Father. He's God from God, as the Creed said. Sure. The, uh, so that's why Theotokos became, well, St. John of Damascus, one of the great saints of the Syrian tradition, he said you can sum up the whole Christian faith in one word, Theotokos, <laughs> mm -hmm. that this man, Jesus, is really divine and really human, born of Mary. But Mary had to be produced. 
Mary had, Mary, it is a doctrine of our church that God just couldn't have been born of any woman. He didn't choose a womb or choose pipes or yes. choose a woman's body. A person had to be capable of hearing the Word of God and conceiving it in her so the Word, as St. John says in his Gospel, who could really become flesh. St. Uh, Ephraim of Syria, he said, Mary conceived by her ear. She mm. heard the Word of God and Christ was formed in her. And, and that's why she's an example. Because we all have to hear the Word of God and Christ has to be formed in all of us. But in her, He really became flesh. And here, a, another point in the Gospel. On our holy days, I think I started to say this earlier and never finished the thought. In our church, on the holy days of Mary, we have many of them, we always read this Gospel of Luke where it says Jesus was preaching one day and a woman in the crowd shouted to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that you have sucked. It's the 11th chapter, I believe, of St. Luke's Gospel. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle there. And, and, and Jesus, what does Jesus answer? He says, Yea, rather blessed are all they who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, some people think that's a put down. Sure. But for us, it's not a put down. What he is saying to that woman is, yeah, my mother is blessed. She's the most blessed of anybody. In fact, in the Magnificat, her song, she says, all generations will call me blessed because she's Jesus' mother. But she's not called blessed because she's Jesus' mother. She's Jesus' mother because she heard the word of God and kept it. So what Jesus was saying is, yes, my mother is blessed. Not because she has a womb and breasts. A lot of wombs and breasts are around. But because she heard God's word and she kept it. And therefore her womb became, as we say on our icons, more spacious than heaven. In your church it's written over yes. your altar, mm -hmm. more spacious than the heavens. Because Mary gave birth to God in human flesh. So that's, how, that's her place in the church, theologically so to speak. She's the instrument of the incarnation and the salvation of the world and her son is her own savior but then of course there's her place in the life of the church as the one who is becomes our mother from the cross we can we can pursue that also in a bit this is absolutely wonderful and we'll be uh, back with father tom to talk a little bit more about uh, the birth giver of god and uh, her place in the church. Uh, but before that, Mother Magdalena is going to tell us a little bit about how the Mother of God is a person in her life now. And um, uh, I'm really anxious to hear this. Why do the Orthodox use three fingers to make the sign of the cross? The three fingers symbolize the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The two fingers folded down signify the divine and human natures of Christ. Until some time after 1204, it was the other way round. Two fingers straight out, three held down, as is still practiced by Russian old ritualists. Mother Magdalena is with the Orthodox <coughs> Monastery of the Transfiguration in Elwood City, Pennsylvania. Mother, welcome. Thank you. We're here talking about the Theotokos, the Mother of God. And everyone always, I guess, talks to you about as a monastic, what mm -hmm. role does she play? But you had a life before you were a monastic. Did she play a role in your life? She did, actually, even before I was born. Um, How is I, that? Well, my mother tells me that both of my grandmothers dedicated me to the Mother of God. So from the time that I was a child, she was always a part of my life. I remember as a child making little altars, the little bringing flowers and having a statue of her. Um, and so she, she was really a part of my life as I grew up. Um, however, when I came to my college years, that was, those were difficult years as they are for so many college students, and uh, I fell away from the faith. And uh, I actually went and I started studying yoga for a while. But interestingly enough, in the center where I was, there were, it was, used to be a Catholic convent. And there were two stained glass windows, one of Christ and one of the Mother of God. Well, I was too mad at Christ. I didn't want anything to do with him. But Mary, I used to go sit under her window, and I would do my yoga meditation under her window. And I really, uh, and I sort of uh, re, got reacquainted with her. And uh, she, uh, I believe, was the cause of my coming back to Christ was through her prayers and through her intercession. 
Um, so, uh, and then she, then she played a, uh, she continued to play a, a role in my life ever since then, because ever since then I've been so grateful to her for doing that. When we talk about her playing a role though, what do we mean by that? Do you f sense a presence? Tell me when you think about your relationship with the Mother of God, what is that? Well, now, of course, now as a nun, um, she is the mother of the one to whom I've given my life. And so in that sense, it's a very intimate relationship because she's very much my mother also in the same way that you have a mother-in-law. Uh, and, um, and so she's the person that I can go to for, for anything that I need. In the monastery, she's everywhere. Her icons are everywhere. She's in the services. She's very much present with us, so we learn from her constantly, every day, throughout the day, we're constantly having some kind of contact with her. And so if I need to pray for someone, <clears throat> I'll go into the chapel and I'll go to her icon and I'll light a candle, I'll say a prayer for whoever it is that just called on the phone and said they're in surgery and they need some big prayers. Um, and so all, our, our day is really formed uh, by her very much through the monastery. There are, I would think, some Christians who would say to you, but don't you run the risk of <clears throat> deifying her in a way that she is almost goddess. How would you respond to that? I think uh, my, what I've come to is that because we're so clear that she is a human, and as Father Tom said, merely a human, we can then be free to magnify her and not have to worry about, about deifying her because obviously Christ is our Savior. He is the only Savior. She's not our Savior. But she, when we say, Most Holy Mother of God, save us, we say it in the same way that, go to your son and intercede for us. Right, right. As a monastic, is your relationship different with Mary? Um, we've already talked about that. Certainly she is, if you will, the mother-in-law mm -hmm. of you. But have you seen it grow or change or prosper in some way than when you were in a lay life? I think very much so, and partly because we've, we pay so much attention to her throughout the day. What advice would you give to other Orthodox Christians? Uh, we've talked about what she means to you as a layperson mm -hmm. and as a monastic, but I think we hold her out there for, as an example for all Christians. What role do you think she can play? What relationship can we have with her? How can she make things different in our lives? What she did for me was to show me her son. And I think that's the main thing that she does. That's what, that's what her whole existence is all about. And, and I think for, for other people, um, one time I had someone come, he was a, 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 a fix-it man, a repair man, and he said, he told me, Mary to me is just a womb. That's all, that's all she is. And I thought, if, if somebody marginalizes her to that extent, what are they doing about Christ? What does that say about who they think Jesus Christ is? If he's a man who can't even love his mother and honor her, then what kind of a God is he? And so I think for us, uh, we can, Mary uh, can be that person who teaches us who he is and teaches us how to be in relationship with him. So she can actually guide our whole relationship with Christ. And intercession, let's talk very briefly, we just uh -huh. have a little bit of time about intercession, her role as intercessor. She's the prime intercessor. She's the, uh, you know, you have certain saints that you pray to for cancer or you pray to for jobs or whatever, you can pray to Mary for anything. And she will intercede, and we've had this, this experience very strongly at our monastery. Um, we, we're constantly asking her intercession for other people. Mother Magdalena, thank you so much for being thank with you. us today. So how can Mary, the Mother of God, be a part of our life? Stay tuned while we continue to explore this issue. Why do the bridal couple at an Orthodox wedding go around the table in the center of the church three times? This procession symbolizes going through life together in permanent mutual commitment and as witnesses to the saving message of Christ. The same hymns are sung as when candidates for ordination are conducted three times around the altar. I'm Father John Abdullah, and we're interviewing Father Tom Hopko about the role of Mary the Theotokos, the Mother of God, uh, in our lives. Father Tom, we say that um, Mary intercedes for us. Uh, what, do we, what do we mean by that? Well, intercession uh, technically means that she 
uh, is standing in our place mediating and praying for us and being with us. But I think that when people are together in love and in a communion of love, they are constantly interceding, bearing, mediating, uh, encouraging, inspiring, and so on. And this is what we find in, in all of the, of the saints. In fact, we find that in all other Christians who believe here on earth. Hopefully, we're all bearing each other's burdens. We're always praying for one another. So who would be the one who would do that more than anyone? Well, as we've already been saying, and certainly Mother Magdalena said, Christ's mother Mary has this preeminent foremost place, not only because she's his mother biologically, and in a sense the biology isn't even the important thing as we mentioned, it's her relation to him as a faithful person, an obedient disciple, the one who's constantly pointing to him. Like on our icons, she's, we even call our icons Odegitria, the pointer of the way, and on many of the icons she's holding him, pointing to him. Like at Cana, she said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it, yeah. she said to those people. So she's constantly there uh, bringing us to Christ. And, and here I think it's an important thing too. He brings us to her, not only the other way around. When he's being crucified in St. John's Gospel, yeah. he says to, to John, woman, first he says to Mary, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And John took her. Because what Jesus is saying is, it's not about biology. It's not about, you know, who is your mother biologically. So Mary, as Christ's mother, not only biologically, physically, but spiritually, the one who's with him, she somehow becomes maternal to us as well. And therefore, intercession. Now, if we believe that the dead in Christ are alive in Jesus because he's risen, and those who are baptized and die in him, as one of the, my students once said when I was a teacher in the seminary, what else is there for her to do but to stand there praying and interceding for the rest of us that, that, that we would make it? But still, it's important, though, and, and it has to be really stated. I like to put it this way. Not only Mary is not the great exception, as some people think, because some Christians want to make her an exception from her conception to her sure. death. No, she's the example. But she still is an example. You can't just say she's nothing. No, she's a great example, and we need examples. However, it's important to remember, the gospel is not about Mary. It's about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, crucified and glorified. So the, we don't preach Mary. Mm -hmm. Mary's not part of our proclamation of the Christian faith. So the gospel is not about Mary, but Mary is about the gospel. When you say, what is that gospel? What does it mean? How does it work? Does it work at all? Show me an example of it. Well, our prime example, example is Mary, the mother of Christ, who's full of grace, full of faith. And don't forget, she's humble. She's meek. She's lowly. She virtually disappears, so to speak, in the life of the church. Uh, uh, we call Mary in our church, as you know, Panagia, means the All-Holy One. And, and our bishops even wear like a little medallion mm -hmm. called the Panagia because they have the, the icon of the incarnation of Jesus becoming man. Well, someone once said about Mary, she was not a bishop, not a patriarch, not a pope, not a priest. She was nothing except the All-Holy One. <laughs> and the bishops, the bishops wear a Panagia, but she is the Panagia that they wear. And so she's the living proof. She's for us a proof of the veracity and the truth of the gospel that we are saved by faith, through grace, God's gift, but we have to be like her. We have to be meek, lowly, humble, obedient, believing, rejoicing, all those things that make up a human being's perfection. Uh, that's what we see in her. Now, some people say they pray to her. Sure, we pray to her in the sense that we ask her prayers. Now, we don't worship her, you only worship God. Mm -hmm. And we worship the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We worship Jesus. Sure. We worship the Holy Spirit with the Father. We don't worship Mary or any of the saints. But we can ask her to But we venerate them, we treat them with honor, and we can ask them to pray for us. Just like I could ask you, Father John, pray for me. I could ask my own mother. For example, my mother has departed this life. But I happen to believe that if my mother is not alive with God in, in, in heaven, nobody is, right? Sure. So I could ask my mother, now, if I could ask my mother, how much more can I ask Jesus' mother if he's my Savior? So I think Jesus, when you enter into the church, once you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, 
and enter into the communion of the church, one of the first things that he does is he introduces you to his mother. He said, this is my mother. These are my apostles. These are my prophets. These are my people, you know. Father Tom, are you saying now we can relate to her? We sure. Can... And then another thing also about prayer, which some folks don't realize, that we believe that Jesus' sacrifice, his, his mediation for the world as the one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus, and his death on the cross, that is the act that saves the whole world. That's our faith. Mm -hmm. And when we celebrate the divine liturgy, the Holy Eucharist, we offer to God our lives together with Jesus, our high priest, in sacrifice to the Father, and we beg the Holy Spirit to come upon us. And when we do that, as you know, being a priest, we actually pray for Mary. We say, remembering your saving commandment, the cross, the death, and so on, send thy Holy Spirit upon us, and we offer unto thee this bloodless worship for all of and, and we say patriarchs, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, and then we end up, and especially for our most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious Virgin Mary. So we actually are praying to God through the sacrifice of Christ, even for Mary, because God hears our prayers before He created the world, not right now. So Mary is with us in everything, in every way. She's our example. She's our leader in the church. Uh, she intercedes for us, she's approachable, she's loving, and she says yes. And she's with us every moment, and we're with her. Amen. Right. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Father Tom. Right. Mary, the mother of God, has a role to play in the life of every Christian. Father John, what should we remember from today? The Theotokos is not a great exception, but the great example. She prays for us, she's an example, to us, uh, she supports us, and she's right there with us. Great lessons. And if you'd like to learn more about the Orthodox Christian faith, listen to Orthodoxy Now Wednesday mornings at 9.30 on WEDO Radio at 8, 10 a.m. And be sure to watch Orthodoxy Now on Channel 95, Christian Associates TV in the city of Pittsburgh, and on Comcast On Demand as we bring you programs to help answer your questions. If you have a topic you'd like to learn more about, send it to the address on the screen. And thank you for being with us.